So I've been playing around with the rendering device, trying to figure it out, and I've gotten the basics down more or less, mostly thanks to this minimum compute example and a lot of trial and error. I'm just gonna show you how to send an array of values to the GPU, do some calculations on them, then retrieve those results back in GD script, because that's all I really know how to do so far. So we start by instantiating a local rendering device in our script by calling create local rendering device on the rendering server. And now we need a shader file. In the file system window, right click and create a new text file. Give it a name. Then after it's created, rename it and change the extension from .txt to .glsl. Now right click again and open your resource folder in the file manager. From here, right click the glsl file and open it with the text editor. Now we'll add the bare minimum needed for a compute shader. At the very top, add hashtag compute in square brackets, which will indicate that this is a compute shader. Below that, add the version directive to indicate the minimum version this shader is written for, which will be 4.5. This is done by typing hashtag version 450. And lastly, we'll add a main function. This will run when our shader is executed, and for now, we'll just leave it empty. Back in our Godot script, we'll load the shader file and get it spur v. This is a standardized intermediary language used to port shaders from one language to another. We then call shader create from spur v on the rendering device with it as our argument. This will return the resource ID of that shader, which will be assigned to a variable. Anytime you create something on the rendering device, a resource ID for what was created will be returned. Next, we'll create a compute pipeline for that shader on the rendering device using the shader's RID. Now we'll begin a compute list. This returns an index that can be used to reference that list. I'm going to refer to it as an ID. After that, bind the compute pipeline to the compute list, with the list's ID as the first argument and the pipeline's RID as the second. Next, we dispatch the compute list. The first argument is the ID of the compute list to be dispatched, and the next three define the number of work groups. But more on that later. We'll just set them all to one for now. Lastly, we submit the rendering device to make it start executing. And congratulations, you just run a compute shader that does absolutely nothing. So now let's send some values to the GPU, do some basic math there, then print the result in GD script. First, I'll create a packed float 64 array with numbers 1 to 16. Data must be sent to the GPU as an array of bytes, so I'll convert it into a packed byte array. Next, we'll create a storage buffer on the rendering device containing this data. The storage buffer's size in bytes must be explicitly set to the size of the data it contains. This will be the size of the byte array. Now, create an already uniform object. Set its type to uniform type storage buffer. Set its binding to an integer. This is an index used to access the buffer from a uniform set in the shader script. Finally, add the RID of the storage buffer we created on the rendering device. Now we need to create a uniform set for our shader on the rendering device. The first argument is an array containing all the uniforms that will be in this set. The second is the RID of our shader. And the third is an index used to reference this set in the shader. And we'll also bind this to the compute list using the set index as the third argument. We'll now head back to our shader file. To access the storage buffer in the shader, we type layout and then a pair of parentheses. In those parentheses, we define the set and binding index to tell the shader where to find the buffer. The storage buffer is like a struct, and a struct is like a class that only contains properties. So after the parentheses, type buffer, then create a quote unquote class name for the buffer. Then follow that with two curly brackets, and inside declare an uninitialized variable with a type matching the array we created in GDScript. After the curly brackets, put an instance name. This is what we use to reference the storage buffer in the main function. Now in the main function, we'll access each item in the data array using a local invocation ID. This ID is a VEC3 with values that are incremented every time this shader runs within a workgroup. And the number of invocations is determined by the size of that workgroup. We define that size up here like this, and it's defined as a three-dimensional array. So let's say X and Y are set to two, the first invocation, the x and y values of the invocation ID will both be set to zero. In the second invocation, x will be set to one and y will still be zero. In the third, x will return to zero and y will be one, and then the fourth, both will be one. Since we're working with a one-dimensional array, we'll make our work groups one-dimensional by setting the y and z local sizes to one and x to the size of our array. Now we'll use gl underscore local invocation ID dot x as an index to iterate through our data array and increase each value by 100. Back in our Godot script, after we submit the rendering device, we'll call sync on it. This tells our GD script to wait for the compute shader to finish. After that, we'll call buffer get data, with the storage buffer's RID as the argument, to get the updated byte array. Then convert that byte array back to a float array and print the result. So on that screen, I'm just going to go over work groups a little bit. Back in the shader file, I'll change the local size x to half the length. Now this shader will only be invoked 8 times and only iterate through the first half of the array. The number of work groups is determined in 3 dimensions as well. So here I'll leave y and z at 1 and set the x value to 2. Now we'll have two work groups, each with four invocations, and we'll have enough invocations to iterate through the entire array again. But the invocation ID will be reset when the second group is started, so we'll only iterate through the first half twice. You can picture all the work groups as a bunch of cubes or rectangular prisms making up one big one. It needs for a group being made up of a bunch of smaller cubes, which would be the invocations. Now, each invocation has its three-dimensional index, 
or local invocation ID within that work group, but it also has a 3D index within the cube that contains all the work groups, which is called the global invocation ID. We can use this to iterate through the data array as well, and now the index will continue in its second work group from where it left off in the first. That's pretty much all I have to share on the rendering device for now, but I'll make more videos as I figure more out. Hopefully this is helpful and thanks for watching.